Hello, I'm Paul Walbeck, Dean of the George Washington University Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Today I'm talking with Tara Sinclair, Professor of Economics and International Affairs and Co-Director of GW's Steckler Research Program on Forecasting. Dr. Sinclair also is a member of the Bureau of Labor Statistics Technical Advisory Committee and serves as a senior fellow with the Indeed Hiring Lab. Welcome, Dr. Sinclair. It's great to be here. Well, let's start with the obvious, COVID-19 and its effect on the economy. Can you talk with us some about that? Sure. I mean, obviously, it's a huge topic at this point. And so if we think back to, you know, let's start with February of 2020, before all of this was really hitting the U.S. economy. And then we were really thinking that we were going to have a fairly normal economic environment, that maybe we were fairly close to full employment, GDP growth was moderate, everything looked pretty good. And then COVID hit, and all of a sudden we shifted from thinking about a world where you know, some of our biggest concerns were that you know, the economy was not growing as robustly as we would have liked, and we were concerned about inequality, and then all of a sudden we were concerned about a you know, huge economic collapse in the US and around the world. So these days, you know, some of the big economic topics that people are talking about is you know, people are very concerned about prices rising more quickly than we've seen in a long time. And we're also seeing you know, an interesting event where we still have in the US about 5 million fewer jobs than we had pre-pandemic, but we're at the same time seeing that we've got a record number of vacancies of jobs open and employers are really reporting that they're having a hard time filling those roles. So there's a lot of shifts happening in the economy right now and trying to figure out how much of this is temporary, how much of it is permanent is really where everybody's sitting at in terms of research right now. So when I think about Congress, the Federal Reserve, Treasury Department, other actors in government, are there things that they can do more of to help or things that they should do less of to help? What's going on there? Well, one word that keeps coming up over and over again when describing our economic conditions is unprecedented. You know, that was true in March of 2020. That remains true today. So it's very hard for policymakers to make decisions because a lot of what they're basing their forecasts on is going to be on historical precedent and experiences we've had in the past. And if we haven't seen anything like this before, it's much harder to come up with good policy prescriptions. And so we see you know, a lot of different policies being you know, thrown out there right now, and there's a lot of uncertainty about those policies. And one of the challenges for decision makers is that uncertainty. So not knowing what the policies are going to look like slows down the decisions that businesses are willing to make because they're like, well, wait, if I wait a couple of months, maybe the economic landscape is going to be significantly different. So I probably shouldn't put a lot of money into one project right now. And that's one of the big concerns that, that I have going forward is what's going to happen uh, with you know, just clarifying what policy is going to look like and making it as, as clear as we possibly can in a very uncertain environment. So what do you do when you're trying to do forecasting, mm -hmm. when you are in this period of uncertainty, of what value are the data? How do you do the type of analysis we tend to do? Well, so on the one hand, you know, obviously every bit and drop of data is being mined you know, just mercilessly by everyone, you know, from every decision maker, from you know, households to firms to stock market traders to you know, all sorts of policy makers. And you know, what's really exciting is there all, are all sorts of different kinds of data coming in that we didn't have pre-pandemic. So you know, we've got the Google mobility data, we've got you know, in, Indeed's job posting data, we've got data on open table reservations. We've got all these different sorts of, of data that can tell us what's happening, but none of them have a really long track record. And so that's one of the challenges is that a lot of these data that we're using to make our forecasts and our predictions, they have performed pretty well in terms of thinking about the downturn, but we're not quite so sure what they're going to tell us about how things are going to be going forward. And so you know, on the one hand, you know, this, all this data is precious and we're trying to just really hoover in every bit of data. And that's something that we know from uh, forecast evaluation research is that when times are uncertain, you need to bring in as much data as possible. You can use a much simpler model in normal times, but we're clearly not in normal times. So if you're bringing in all that data, 
it, it's great and you're excited, but at the same time, there's a wide range of potential failures of these forecasts. So we have to make forward-looking decisions, and we have to also recognize that the information that we're building off of might not be giving us a very good picture of the future. So one of the, the questions that I have is, there's a question about the utility of the data to mm -hmm. answer the questions, but are we also facing some situations or issues that we haven't had to deal with as systematically in the past, like supply chain issues or the like? Yes, I think the supply chain issues is a great example. I mean, there, we have so many different issues going on at, at one time. But you know, if we think about the supply chains, that is actually another example of so many different pieces having to get along together. And one of the things that we've really realized is that the shift towards just-in-time manufacturing, where we were really each piece of the chain only ordered the part that they needed when they knew they had an order for the part that they were producing and they built on like that, that, you know, that was really great when things were smooth and stable and we could predict our demand pretty well. The minute we enter into a very uncertain environment, this approach really, really fails. And it's going to be hard to bring that back online and it might be pretty costly. We may have to think about maintaining a little bit more in terms of inventories and really potentially shifting some, some of these models for how we're going to produce longer term. And that's going to cost some economic uh, growth potentially to make those shifts. And nobody likes that idea very much. <laughs> So another topic that comes to mind in this context is just the global political environment as well, uh, with some of the discussion about alliances or um, our relations with countries that have been part of our global supply chain in the past. To what extent does the global politics have an impact on the economics of, that affect us here in the United States? Well, uh, first of all, I will acknowledge that you know, I, I looked a lot to my political science colleagues for you know, the, the bigger political picture. You know, but obviously, there is a clear interplay between economic decisions and political decisions. So on the one hand, as an economist, I'll say you know, some political decisions are not feasible because they're too economically costly. But on the other hand, some economic decisions we'd like to have that would seem very clear from economic theory. One example might be carbon taxes for addressing climate change. That may not be feasible politically. And so we do have this back and forth conversation that we constantly have to have. And when those political alliances are shifting, that can add an extra wrench in the economic wheels as well. So your research focuses on the evaluation of forecasts. So let's think some about the labor market as well as pricing. So how are those forecasts faring right now? And what do they tell us about what the near-term future might hold? Well, one interesting thing that we've seen is that in a lot of ways, uh, things have been quite a bit better from the labor market perspective than what economists initially would have predicted. We thought that the recession would last a lot longer after the initial shock of the pandemic than it, than it did. And in fact, the National Bureau of Economic Research that dates our recessions said that the recession bottomed out in April of 2020. So we've actually been in recovery since then. And you know, we now see that you know, the unemployment rate in the U.S. is still higher than it was pre-pandemic, and we still have about 5 million people fewer employed than what we had pre-pandemic. But at the same time, we're really hearing from lots and lots of employers across a wide range of industries that they are really struggling to find employees. And in fact, that they're having to raise wages significantly. Uh, and so interestingly, you know, on, on the side, uh, you know, some of the work that I do with Indeed, they've run surveys to ask job seekers, you know, what is holding you back from looking for a job uh, you know, more urgently? And what people have said is initially, you know, a few months ago, it was still health concerns. There was still concern about the exposure to the Delta variant. Uh, 
But more recently, you know, people have shifted and said, well, I, I just don't need to look for a job quite yet. Uh, one of the top reasons people have given is because their spouse has paid employment at the moment. And so they can focus on you know, care for children, care for the home, uh, taking their time looking for another job. Uh, so they don't need to look urgently. Uh, and it, so we are seeing this shift that's really shifting from more health concerns to more thinking about their financial position and also you know, their job satisfaction. And so that suggests that we are in this transition where assuming there's not another health shock coming down the line, that people will be coming back to the workforce as employers offer more appealing jobs and conditions. And that just takes time as we shift through all of this. So if you think about it, it's actually a lot like the broader supply chain issues, that we've had this huge shock and shift in our economy broadly. And so in our supply of goods, we're seeing difficulties in figuring out how to get that supply chain restarted. And we're also seeing that in terms of the supply of labor. If we think about uh, prices, uh, on the other hand, this is an area where forecasters have really been surprised and kind of continue to be surprised. We keep seeing forecast errors where we're you know, beating expectations, where prices are growing faster than forecasters expected. And this is an area where we keep pushing out the horizon for how long prices are going to be growing quickly. You know, initially we thought it was just a, a brief shock as people were you know, going out and spending again and there was you know, too much demand, too little supply, but just in a very short term pocket. You know, the Fed would call it transitory. Uh, but then they've really backed off from that and now forecasters are moving out. And so, you know, if we think about what that means for you know, political decisions, you know, a lot of people are really, really concerned about what's happening with you know, faster price growth. But at the same time, we're also seeing faster wage growth. And what we can typically see is that wage growth can be very persistent. Like once you get a raise, it's really hard for an employer to take that back. But prices tend to shift around a bit more. And so one potential outcome of this intersection between the labor market and prices is that we might see some, some wage growth that you know, really helps people, particularly at the lower end of the wage spectrum. And it comes at a cost of higher prices for a little while, but things then settle down, but people have a permanent higher wage rate. There's, there's real hope there that uh, this, all of these adjustments might, might work to bring us a, a healthier, stronger labor market coming out of it. So as we think about where we've been in the past historically, certainly we've had economic uh, challenges previously, whether it be the Great Depression or any of the many recessions that we faced in the decades since the Great Depression. What can we learn from history and about economic recovery and about economic growth? One thing that's really interesting, if you think about economic forecasters, it really everything that they do is built on history and their experience. If we think about the data that goes into forecasting models, we're using historical data series. And so really the only things that we can predict with those sorts of models is things that look like historical events. And so if, oftentimes we talk about how policy is built to fight the last recession. Uh, and if you think about the Great Depression, that's really where macroeconomic research even began, was thinking about the Great Depression and you know, potential policy responses to that. And we've done that with every recession since. And so what's really interesting is if we think about what's happening in po the policy world in response to the pandemic, it's a lot of policy that was built after we learned from the Great Recession from the global financial crisis in 2008 and nine, we brought those policies out, even though completely different causes, right? You know, we, but we made sure we weren't gonna also have a financial crisis along with a global pandemic. And I think that was really, really important that we did that. And that did really prevent another financial crisis but it's not the same, and that's the problem with addressing recessions and the problem with predicting recessions is that they, they do always come from a different source. And so with a different source, there might be different appropriate policy responses 
But in general, we don't predict recessions in advance. We only, you know, some of the best forecasters are just able to recognize when they're first starting. That's pretty late for doing you know, forward-looking policy. So we already have to have some, you know, basically some guns loaded. Uh, and so that's really what we're, we're looking at for, for policy. And we're gonna learn a lot from this one. And we're gonna you know, have a, whatever the next recession is caused by, we're probably gonna have some pandemic response type policy plans for that. But if we think about on the recovery side, this is an area where we really expected that there might be some slowness to this recovery. There, there were basically two, two camps coming into thinking about the economic recovery from the pandemic. There was the V camp, the camp that was like, hey, this was a really deep cut in the economy, but we're gonna bounce right back. And then there was a, you know, the, the really extremely pessimistic camp, like the L camp, where they're like, you know what, we've just dug this big hole and now we're just gonna keep digging forward and we're never really gonna see a, a really robust recovery. Some of that pessimism came from our really slow slog of a recovery out of the Great Recession. People thought, okay, our last recovery was really slow and awful, so this one is probably going to be really slow and awful as well. And in fact, I was fairly pessimistic early on. But it, we've actually seen that there was at least a substantial portion of a V. Uh, and now people are describing this recovery as being more of a reverse radical situation where you can see we dipped down, came up, but now we're still struggling to, to bring back all of the employment. Uh, but on the GDP side, we're pretty much back at pre-pandemic levels, perhaps even close to pre-pandemic. Well, thank you so much for your insights on the economy, Dr. Sinclair. It's been a real pleasure having you here today talking with us about your expertise in forecasting in the economy. Thank you. Thanks, Dean Welbeck.